Make School was founded by two MIT, I think, dropouts actually, who decided like, we want a different way to teach because this doesn't work for us. Growing a network has kind of just helped me stay motivated and given me opportunities because I have people that I can share, like talk about graph convolutional networks with because most people just don't care. Somebody like you who's obtaining a computer science degree, getting a data science specialization, doing an internship in data science, I think you're ticking all the right boxes and you're gonna have no trouble finding interesting work. Sydney, welcome to the show. I'm delighted to have you here. Where in the world are you calling in from? I am currently calling in from the mountains in Southern California. Oh, is it beautiful in the mountains of Southern California? It is beautiful in the mountains of Southern California. Damn, all right. How uh, has the pandemic been lately over there? Uh, things starting to open up? Yeah, they are. It's a little bit less crowded up here. Um, I actually just moved down here from Oakland, so getting a little bit more like space to breathe, so to speak. Nice. That sounds really nice. So we met at ODSE East, the Open Data Science Conference. Uh, and it's funny that they still call them things like East and West and Europe because well, it's all been virtual for the last 18 months. Uh, but I guess the time zones are at least lined up for somebody on the US East Coast or the US West Coast, uh, the European ones. So you were presumably still in California when you came into, uh, I guess, a lecture that I was giving at ODSC East. Um, I would think I was doing one on why linear algebra, calculus, and probability are like key skills for a data scientist to have. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> uh, I wasn't sure. And then and then you came to a like, so they do these, if it was in person, if it was an in-person conference, then I would have done like a book signing. And right. there would have been an opportunity to like meet people in person. And so they did like a virtual one. So it was a Zoom room and maybe like 20 people showed up and you really stood out to me as somebody that was really switched on, asking great questions, really thoughtful responses. And yeah, so I just wanted to connect. We had a brief call and instantly I was like, wow, I feel like I am recording a podcast episode right now because everything that Sydney's saying is so interesting and an audience would love to hear this. So then we set it up and here we are. So there's here the backstory. Um so you are currently studying computer science at Make School. So tell us about that. What is Make School and how did you choose to choose that particular option for getting into a software related career? And then maybe I'm asking way too many questions here, but if you can remember all of them, the final one is why study a computer science program if you wanna be doing data science type stuff? Definitely. Those are all really good questions. So I'll start with the first one. Um, what is Make School? Make School is like, it's a really new program, actually. Um, they've only been a bachelor's degree program for, I think, three years now. Um, basically, it's an applied computer science college, um, meaning that it's really project based. So typically, if you were to go to Stanford and study computer science, you're learning a lot of computer science theory. You might learn a little bit about Java or C. Um, but for the most part, you're not actively coding every day. You're sitting in lectures. Make School was founded by two MIT, I think, dropouts, actually, who decided, like, we want a different way to teach because this doesn't work for us. So they founded Make School. And the premise of Make School is uh, first to get people into tech who otherwise might be intimidated by, for example, the programs at Stanford, and also to get people into tech who really want to learn what they need to know to work. Um, so that kind of leads to like why I picked Make School. I had gone to college before and kind of in the midst of a career shift, I picked Make School because I didn't want to take three more years to finish a bachelor's degree when I had already gone for three years. Um, so the accelerated part was beneficial as well as the fact that it was actually, I'm going to be hands-on, I'm going to be doing the things that I need to know how to do. Um, nice. So we, we haven't mentioned that explicitly, but that's one of the benefits of this program is that you get a bachelor's degree, but it's in two years, which is, yes. a, yeah, really accelerated. Definitely, definitely. Which 
um, actually a lot of my peers went to college before. So most of us, this isn't like our first shot at getting our bachelor's degree. So for us, it's kind oh, of even no better because we can finish faster. Have you met any peers in person or has it been entirely virtual? Um, the school experience has been entirely virtual. Although when I was living in the Bay, I did make a point to set up, uh, my partner and I set up this like group meetup thing so that those of us who did live in the Bay could go and have lunch or have a park day or go to the beach um, so that we're not totally sequestered. That sounds really smart. Uh, does that mean that your partner's on the program too? Yeah, that's correct. Wow, that's cool. But you didn't meet on it. You decided to do it together. Yeah. So um, he's actually the reason that I chose Make School over other options um, because he was he had applied and got accepted. And we went to visit the campus in October of 2019. And that's kind of when I started to be like, oh, this is this is kind of cool. <laughs> uh, so they do have a campus uh, and presumably you will actually get to experience. So you're right now wrapping up the first year of the two year program, right? Yeah, that's correct. So, and you're starting an internship, which we'll talk about shortly, a data science internship, which sounds really cool. Uh, but I have some other segues planned before we get there. Um, so uh, just one more quick question about this is that I guess you will actually return to being in campus probably in the fall. It seems like in the US at least, we're lucky that vaccines have been taken up uh, really quickly. And yeah, it seems like we're not even gonna be wearing masks. Uh, I mean, so at the time of recording in mid-May, the Center for Disease Control, so this like federal body, said that vaccinated people don't need to wear masks anymore uh, as of yesterday at the time of recording. So super interesting. So anyway, so I assume that you will actually be able to go back to a campus. Um, that'll be great. Um, anyway, I think I interrupted you uh, with questions when you were trying to tell me more about the program. So, okay, where did we get to? It's two years, we're halfway through. Uh, it's all been virtual, but there is a campus. You were saying the campus is like beautiful or? It's pretty cool. It's a building in San Francisco. Um, I don't know that much about San Francisco. It's somewhere near the Civic Center area. Um, but basically it's like a cool multi-story older building and they have all of these like kind of really unique classroom setups and things like that. So it's not like, I remember going and visiting, you know, regular universities, you walk into a lecture hall and it looks like a lecture hall here. It's kind of like, you know, you walk into this like hacker room of, you know, classmates sitting around all like coding. And sometimes there's like a teacher with a whiteboard. Um, but it's, you know, it's really unique. They have this whole like grand hall. There's like this ballroom that they just like they put a lot of work into this building. And um, it is set to be a, like a hybrid in-person online experience in the fall. I haven't actually decided if I want to move back to the Bay to go in person, but right. there will be that option. So. Very cool. And so I think, uh, well, so one of my earlier questions about the kind of make school experience is, um, so notwithstanding the unique situation of having a partner that had already been accepted to the program, what kinds of, uh, reasoning goes into choosing to, to do a curriculum, like a two-year computer science degree, when I think you ultimately want to be in the data science field. Definitely. And part of part of the answer to that question is honestly just when I first started, I just knew they had a data science track and I didn't know anything about data science. Right. So, oh, so they have that. That's cool. Yeah, exactly. So they have kind of a specific track for data science. The kind of caveat with this track is that it's still being built out. Um, so the pro of that is it's been really cool. I've been able to be a big part of helping build that track out. I was working as a curriculum assistant for the majority of the year. Um, helping mm. one of our new instructors who actually came from NASA um, build out this track, figure out what students need to learn. The con is that a lot of my experience so far, a lot of my knowledge is actually coming from kind of self-study to supplement on the side the fact that this data science program, um, you know, it hasn't been around for, for 10 years. So it's not as robust right. as it could be. I guess the nice thing about that is that that's what it's like in the real world. Right. <laughs> <Is> it <laughs> 
it's self-study anyway, most of the time. Um, okay, cool. So you didn't actually know that, so you didn't necessarily have the outcome of being a data scientist in mind when you started. I, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't. I knew that I wanted to do AI, but did I know what that meant? No, right. not really. <laughs> right, I see. And then so, all right, so let's talk about that. So what was the inspiration to, to be interested in AI? Yeah, this, okay, so this is- What a were you doing before? Yeah. You already studied, you already went to college, and so you're making this career change into AI. Um, how did that happen? How did that come about? Definitely. Um, so just a quick prerequisite um, to kind of set up the story or the why, I was, going to school originally for uh, to transfer to a pre-medical program. That was the goal. I wanted to go be a doctor. I was working at the time. Um, I was actually living in West Michigan um, prior to moving back to California, and I was working as a phlebotomist. So I had worked at a blood center and was working at a, at a metro hospital. And, you know, in Michigan, it's a lot less regulated, you could say. You can do on-the-job training to be a phlebotomist. You don't have to be licensed. Um, and I had gotten my NHA license, but when I moved back to California, I had to get my California licensing as well. So I see the NHA is like some national qualification. For yeah, phlebotomy. exactly. And, yeah. Uh, what is phlebotomy? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, phlebotomy is effectively the people who draw blood and, and run your labs at the hospital. Or if you go to a blood center, the people who stick you basically. Nice. All right. I see. Uh, yeah. it's a very, yeah. Uh, yeah, very essential uh, career path. And uh, yeah, plays a big, important role in the hospital. So the NHA, the NHA was this like national qualification, but moving to California, you had to get another qualification, the like local, the state uh, licensing. Exactly. So I moved out here and I'm re-enrolling in another college to retake credits that didn't transfer and to you know, try to continue back on this path. In the midst of this, I'm spending all this money trying to get this new license. And part of that was um, effectively, like you have to do this thing called an externship, which is you go work for free for 40 hours somewhere to prove that you know what you're doing and you're not gonna hurt anyone. Right. So I was doing this in this very like long drawn out process. It had taken me a year just to get to this point, just because I had to work at the same time um had to go back to working at like you know minimum wage like food service jobs and things like that which was frustrating for me and right. then you know I go work at this clinic in North Hollywood and in the midst of this work experience I I fell in love at the staff with the staff at this clinic um and I I really enjoyed being there it was very similar to being in like the neighborhoods that I grew up in in San Diego um and, you know, it was it was like people that I was used to being around. But one of the things that kind of dawned on me as I'm working at this clinic was I'm feeling disillusioned with school. I'm feeling disillusioned with having to work and trying to, to pay for all this. And at the same time, I'm realizing I'm never going to see these patients if I just go be a doctor and work at Kaiser or, you know, Cedar sinai or any of the places that I dreamed of working. I'm never going to see these people. So I you know, finished up the semester and effectively just dropped out of school and just said, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm going to move to LA and go do art or whatever, but I don't know what to do next. So in the midst of all of this, I start to become interested in this idea of AI for healthcare because of, you know, reading these papers that are talking about potentially trying to lower the cost of drugs by using AI to help with, you know, drug development or, um, you know, reduce the cost of radiology services through AI radiology services. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And at that point, I was kind of like, okay, well, this seems like a great way to still make an impact, um, but possibly make a better, like a greater impact and to possibly make an impact on these like accessibility gaps to try to actually help the people that like I grew up with. Totally. This episode is brought to you by Super Data Science. Yes, our online membership platform for transitioning into data science and the namesake of the podcast itself. 
In the Super Data Science platform, we recently launched our new 99-day data scientist study plan, a cheat sheet with week-by-week -week instructions to get you started as a data scientist in as few as 15 weeks. Each week, you complete tasks in four categories. The first is Super Data Science courses to become familiar with the technical foundations of data science. The second is hands-on projects to fill up your portfolio and showcase your knowledge in your job applications. The third is a career toolkit with actions to help you stand out in your job hunting. And the fourth is additional curated resources such as articles, books, and podcasts to expand your learning and stay up to date. To devise this curriculum, we sat down with some of the best data scientists as well as many of our most successful students and came up with the ideal 99-day data scientist study plan to teach you everything you need to succeed so you can skip the planning and simply focus on learning. We believe the program can be completed in 99 days and we challenge you to do it. Are you ready? Go to superdatascience.com slash challenge, download the 99 day study plan and use it with your Super Data Science subscription to get started as a data scientist in under 100 days. And now let's get back to this amazing episode. Code scales a lot better than in-person appointments with a physician, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So that's super cool. So you you get to understand probably through like popular press articles that AI, generally speaking, is making a transformative effect in healthcare. Yeah, that's cool. And then, uh, and then you figure out, okay, computer science is a great foundation for artificial intelligence, and I totally agree because, yeah, I mean, in terms of getting a model into production and having it do something in the real world, you need computer science skills to do that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, they're like equally important complements. building a model, being able to deploy it. And I dare say in the job market these days, I think that having both of those skills is hugely valuable and that, you know, somebody like you who's obtaining a computer science degree getting a data science specialization, doing an internship in data science. I mean, I think you're ticking all the right boxes and you're going to have no trouble finding interesting work uh, when you graduate. So, all right. Uh, we're going to get into your internship in a moment, but you just finished up your term. You had a big project on graph convolutional networks. Mm -hmm. And I have a quote from you uh, <laughs> on a post that you wrote that says, um, graph theory is way cooler than you thought. And so tell us what graph theory is and why it's cool. And then tell me what graph convolutional networks are. I genuinely don't know. I know what convolutional networks are. I know what graphs are. I think I know what graph theory is, but I don't, I can't in my mind imagine how those two worlds blend together, convolutions and graph theory. So I'm looking forward to my mind being blown. Definitely. So just uh, the precursor, what, what is graph theory? Graph theory is yeah. a mathematical theory. And basically, it describes a graph, which is a series of nodes and edges. And to kind of give like a real world example of this, um, one example of a graph, for example, is a molecular diagram right? A molecule can be represented in a graph. It has bonds, edges, and it has nodes or atoms. So another good example is a map, right? You have nodes, which are places, addresses, and you have edges, which are streets. So graph theory is the theory that kind of describes how to traverse this graph, how to get from one point to another, how to, you know, add nodes, how to perform calculations on this thing. Um, and why this is important is because a lot of data, a lot of things are better understood when you understand networks. So you can look at an ecosystem and you can say, okay, I understand, or let's to use a consistent example. If you look at a molecule, you can say, okay, I have two hydrogens and an oxygen. Um, and that's great to know that is great. And if you're a chemist, you can then infer what the bonds are going to look like. You know that you're looking at water. But if you're not a chemist, if you're a data scientist and you only see this list, you might not have the whole picture of what this actually represents, why it matters, how it behaves. 
But when you can start to represent this thing as a graph, you can start to then also infer how these relationships affect each other. And you can actually make classifications on, on that, on the whole graph thing. So that's why graph theory is cool, because as a data scientist, uh, you know, we very often have this Euclidean data, this, this list structure, it's very like set, like, you know, two dimensional like data. And most neural networks really understand that well. They are good at performing calculations on this data and they, they get it, so to speak. When you get this graph, that's this arbitrary thing. It doesn't take up a set amount of space. It doesn't have a set amount of nodes and you can't measure distance. It's non-Euclidean. So your typical convolutional neural network can't look at it the same way that it looks at pixels, um, which right. interestingly enough, an image is a graph as well. Um, it's just, it's fixed. Right. Um, so I'm going to, I'm just going to interrupt you for one sec to break down just a couple terms or repeat some things back to you totally. um, to make sure that me and the audience are getting it completely. So you gave some great examples of graphs, like a molecule, um, a map. And so the key, the really big key terms here are nodes and edges. And so like mm -hmm. nodes are kind of, I mean, I guess both a node and an edge are kind of data, mm -hmm. but you might often think about, so a, a node, like you said, it could be an atom connected to other atoms, but it could even just be like your friends. So it's like mm -hmm. me and all of my friends, we could be a graph and any of my friends, so I know all my friends. So there's a no, or this, there's an edge. I'm mm -hmm. a node. You're a node. There's an edge connecting us. And then you know you have friends, and so there's edges connecting all those. If I knew some of those friends, then I'd have an edge connecting me to them. They're all nodes, and you could actually have information on the edges too. So it could be a number that's like the number of times we've met, mm -hmm. and so you know there's like a five between us, but there's a 10 between me and someone else in my graph of friends. Um, I guess, you, but it could be any kind of data on the nodes or the edges. And so anyway, so a really rich way of storing data. Um, but like you're saying, it's not Euclidean, which just means, uh, so a Euclidean space is something that we can like measure with a ruler. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, just, yeah, like, if you throw a football, you can measure that with a ruler. It's like everything that we do moving around in space is in a Euclidean world. Um, anyway, so convolutional neural networks, they're a, a machine, typically a machine vision approach. They're a way of recognizing um, spatial patterns in the Euclidean world, like you say. So like pixels on a screen um, or even moving video. So you have that extra dimension. Um, it's still happening in this Euclidean world. Everything's on this really fixed graph of like a set number of pixels. But your graphs in graph theory, your nodes and your edges, they don't conform necessarily to that strict structure. And they can be, yeah, like you said, there could be any number of nodes. You could have any number of friends in the network or whatever. Um, and so traditional convolutional neural networks break down. All of that, I'm with you. The one piece I still genuinely know nothing about, and that's the piece I need you to fill in on next, is how a convolutional neural network can handle something that isn't in a Euclidean space. How can it handle a graph? What does it do? Definitely. So to really get the detailed like version of how this works, um, I did write an article about the mathematics behind this. But just to break it down for humans who might be listening and who don't want to go read a bunch of math. Um, <laughs> what, what a graph convolutional network will do first is effectively take a representation of the graph that a computer can understand and do some things with that so that we can like embed the graph. So let's imagine that we take our molecule diagram and we like write it on a piece of paper. Like we, we kind of flatten it. Um, they call it like embedding the graph. So we take an adjacency matrix, which is a way of representing a graph in a sparse matrix of ones and zeros that denote edges. And then you can, you know, perform some steps to then embed this into a, like two dimensional like vector space that then can be classified just like 
an image of a cat or a dog. Cool. All right. Yeah. So it's that it's that embedding step that's key. And so it allows you to transform what could be a structure that is incompatible with going into a convolutional ne network. You can uh, you probably you probably have to choose. You might even have to make some thoughtful choices mm -hmm. about how you embed that graph. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And a good example of this is I just, um, for my project, embedded the proteins benchmark data set. So it takes, I think, 1300 graphs, which are all different, like molecular diagrams, effectively. And it's able to then classify what protein is it out of like two classes. Um, so it is basically able to take I think there's like 40 some nodes in each graph and it's able to, you could just say like it stretches them out. It just like it, it flattens it. It puts it into the vectors that are neural networks that are like our convolutional like layer can then understand and then it can do something meaningful with that data. Nice. So we take a 3D structure, this 3D molecular structure of this protein, and then you embed it into a two dimensional vector. Um, which actually, yeah, that makes perfect sense because a protein is a single amino acid sequence. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess that's what it is. So you kind of flatten it out into that amino acid sequence and then the convolutional layer. Um, so we often think about, um, two dimensional convolutions, which are looking for patterns in pixels in an image, but equally you can have a one dimensional convolution, for example, applied to natural language, which is just a string of characters or a string of words. And you can look for, say, a pattern of words that's associated with positive movie review as opposed to a negative movie review. And so I guess that's similar to what's happening here. It's looking for spatial one-dimensional patterns in this protein sequence. And so that's like the input into your neural network. And then you said that there's an output that you're predicting. It was a class problem. So you have like two... So from, I think you mentioned 1400 proteins and those like split into two different classes of proteins. Was that it? Yeah. And to be honest, I don't remember like which ones you're classifying. If you like download the data set, it's all just represented as like numbers. I actually reached out to the author to try to get right. like, English labels, um, but didn't right. get a response. But yeah, I mean. Oh no. <laughs> so it's like class zero and class one. Yeah, pretty much. That you're predicting. <laughs> I'm like, so okay. Great, but like, how do I tell people what I did? <laughs> right, damn. All right, still sounds like a successful project. Um, that's really cool. And it's great to hear that one year into a program like Make Academies, you're doing really significant modeling, like neural networks, embedding three-dimensional structures into vectors. That's amazing. And I mean, what was your experience with programming and like data science related things prior to starting your program? Was there much at all? No, not at all. I, uh, attended, yeah, I pretty much like didn't have a computer three months before I started my school. I was like, off uh, yeah, I knew nothing about programming and a lot of it is uh, self-study, but I mean, they do a pretty good job of like pushing you forward as long as you're willing to, you know, give, give, like meet them halfway. And put in the work. Yeah, I, that's a given for sure. Um, and it sounds like you're definitely meeting them at least halfway. That sounds amazing. I mean, given that you're helping create their data science curriculum, uh, they probably don't just go handing those out to everyone. Um, you're probably meeting them more than halfway and demonstrating um, some real capability and determination. That is super cool. So, all right, well, that's that adds a really interesting twist on my next question, which is, so in the Make Academy, uh, in Make School, uh, uh, you, what kinds of tools do you use? Like, is there a development environment that you're typically using? What programming languages are you typically working in when you're doing data science work? Like you just were talking about your graph convolutional networks. What uh, software packages were you using? Yeah. Um, so. Specifically for my um, graph convolutional networks um, term project, which was actually an independent study uh, course. Um, so like I got to pick this topic and, and all of that. I So I used a library called Spectral 
and PyTorch Geometric um, for, for two different implementations of graph convolutional networks. And typically in coursework, um, in terms of IDEs, we're using either Colab or um, like Google Colab, sorry, or Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Lab. Um, the benefit of Colab is the fact that you can very easily like copy over a notebook and you have free GPU runtimes. So we've been actually switching over to using more Colab, although there are limitations uh, with that as well, of course, like RAM, for example, is something yeah, so, I ran into. <laughs> yeah, so I, I teach entirely with Colab for mm -hmm. several years now. I absolutely love being able to teach a class with Colab. So prior to Google Colab existing, so to access Google Colab, all you need is a Google login, which is free. So like a Gmail login. You just create a login, you can go into Colab, and a Jupyter Notebook comes up. So um, probably a lot of listeners are familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, but they allow you to execute code and view the output of that code in this nice, um, neat notebook. And that includes any images that you output, any tables, all of it, you just see they're presented in this one big notebook. And so that's kind of a, it's an easy way to learn how to program. And it's an easy way to share notebooks of code with other people, particularly if you're thoughtful about how you create them. And so uh, my book that I wrote, any teaching that I do, all of the code examples happen in Jupyter Notebooks. And when I'm teaching live, I do it in a Google Colab session because I know that anybody anywhere in the world can just log in for free, get access to this relatively powerful cloud compute instance that has already all of the software dependencies uh, needed and that those software dependencies are going to be the same as mine. Now, yeah, you've, there, so you mentioned RAM. So potentially, if you're doing a really big data science project and you're going to need a lot of RAM, there could be constraints on these boxes. So it's going to be, it's almost certain to be more RAM and compute than you have in your laptop in Google Colab. So that's great. But still, you know, it's not like um, the Google Cloud Platform or Amazon Web Services where you could just like tick a box and get access to an even bigger instance. Um, so that's one limitation is if the problem that you're tackling is a bigger problem than the machine can handle. Uh, another problem is that I mentioned how great it is that the software dependencies are there already for you, but the downside is you can't out of the box control what specific version is installed. So someday, it hasn't happened to me yet, but someday I'm going to be teaching a class and a line in my code is not going to work because a software version has changed. And then I'm going to be scrambling in class awkwardly to try to figure out how to fix it in Stack Overflow or something. Um, and then there's one other problem. Oh, yeah. This is the problem that probably uh, trips you up the most. In order to prevent abuse of this free cloud instance, you can't just have people running them all the time, mining Bitcoin. So um, there's, if you're inactive in the session for like half an hour to an hour or something like that, you're, the session ends. And so anything that you had in memory is lost. Now that's fine if it's relatively not co computationally intensive to like just rerun all the code cells again that you had running and you were like, you did everything in a thoughtful order so that that makes sense if you just re-execute all the code. Anyway, so Colab is awesome. I use it all the time. There's some limitations with listener. I'm sorry. You're the guest. I shouldn't be talking so much, Sydney. But uh, I don't know. I just thought people would want to know. So that's cool that you guys are using Colab. Uh, and then for your specific project, you mentioned for working with um, graph convolutional networks, there was Spectral and PyTorch something. PyTorch what? Yeah, PyTorch Geometric, um, which I knew nothing about until this term. But it provides, oh, yeah. And so I guess you're, so it sounds like you learn how to code in Python. That makes yes. sense, primarily. Yeah, yep. At Make School, there's like uh, like different like web development tracks as well. So depending on what track you're in, you might also learn like JavaScript and Go. But for data science, we're pretty much doing everything in Python. That makes a lot of sense to me. It is the, uh, yeah, it's the most widely useful language in data science today, particularly if you're interested in production deployments. Um, so that makes a huge amount of sense to me. And um, all right, 
So that's great. So you finished your first year at Make School, and now you're starting an internship. So uh, obviously, at the time of recording, you haven't started it yet. Uh, I know that's coming up soon, but it's great that that's happened. It's a company called Greenlight Biosciences. What do they do? Definitely. So uh, Greenlight Biosciences is um, a biosciences company. Basically, they are working <laughs> on um, RNA technologies. So um, they're doing a lot of research into applications um, similar to like, for example, like the COVID vaccine that just rolled out is, of course, the most like public thing that probably everyone will have a reference to. Um, so they are working on food production and food sustainability problems, as well as um, like life sciences and, and healthcare problems as well. Yeah, that sounds like a great internship. Congrats. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I noticed a while ago, uh, you'd written a blog post about people from kind of non-traditional backgrounds coming into data science, computing, um, who, yeah, who I guess might not have had the same kind of uh, mentorship or like obvious examples to like go into that kind of space. So, you know, you pretty recently started learning programming from scratch and were like, wow, AI could make a big difference in healthcare and you just jumped into it. So how can listeners who similarly, you know, are in a similar situation to you, how can they also get so deeply involved in computer science and data science like you have? Definitely. One of the key things for me was, first of all, just, just discipline. I definitely needed to, to like get started, to be taken seriously, and also just to feel like I kind of like should be here. I needed to put in a, a lot of work and it needed to be very, very consistent work. Aside from that, I think one of the biggest pieces of advice that I could possibly just give is like grow your network reach out to people, um, attend conferences, just really like integrate yourself into the community, whether that's like open source community sharing data on Kaggle or whether that's, you know, communities at conferences, communities within your school, um, people on Stack Overflow. I've found PyLadies meetups on uh, meetup.com or whatever. Um, yeah, exactly. Just growing my network has been so integral to having certain opportunities as well as just like most, most of the time your family for like most people don't like the, the friends that I had in high school don't want to hear me talk about computer science. It, right. you know, might feel very like um, uppity or nerdy or just something that like they can't relate to. And therefore like that might like, kind of put them off a little bit or like make them feel stupid or just they just they don't get it they don't want to hear about math it's not interesting to them so growing a network has kind of just helped me stay motivated and given me opportunities because I have people that I can share like talk about graph convolutional networks with because you know most people just don't care <laughs> That makes perfect sense. And one of the nice things about this virtual world we live in is that no matter where you are, you can be involved in these communities. So you and I have never met in real life, but uh, you know, through shared interests, you meet at a conference and you know, yeah, you grow your network. And so it's uh, if you imagine a graph <laughs> and your main piece of advice is that if uh, you're getting started in your data science career, and right now, your graph is just a node with no edges. Um, you're going to need to grow some edges and uh, start adding a bunch of nodes to your uh, professional data science network. Um, and yeah, and I totally agree. I think it makes it way easier to, yeah, to stay motivated, to stay on track when there's other people to, to share interesting things that you've discovered with. Um, that's actually, that's been something big for me through the pandemic that I used to be sitting in a room of people who thought very similar to me and were interested in the same kinds of things. And, you know, I'm super lucky that I get to do a podcast once a week and have that. And I still have conversations with my colleagues, obviously, but it isn't all the time during the day. And I can't wait actually to get back into an office and have that very intimate, uh, professional network. Um, 
Yeah. Awesome advice. I really appreciate that. So, all right. So you're basically a year into your AI career. What do you want to look back on when you retire from your AI career decades from now? Definitely. My main goal is I want to like make some kind of a tangible impact. And I know maybe that's a little like cliche. Everybody thinks they want to change the world and all of that. Um, but I, I at least want to have like one thing where I can just be like, oh, hey, look, this makes a meaningful difference in people's lives. There's a measurable difference in their quality of life or access to this thing. And I did that or I, you know, was an integral part of the team that did that. Um, definitely, I don't want to go through my career just passively working on, you know, ads for Google. Um, it doesn't interest me. I want to look back and actually say, you know, I helped. I helped actually make some kind of a positive difference in, in someone's life. I totally hear that. And I think that is a great motivation for a career. And luckily, data science, computer science, AI, all of the above is an absolutely amazing place to be able to make impacts like that. In fact, I can refer the listener back to probably countless episodes uh, that of the Super Data Science podcast recently. But one really good example is episode 447 with Michael Segala, who is involved in translating a lot of ideas in a lot of industries, and we go over tons of them, but we talk about the medical industry in particular quite a bit in that episode. And there is an enormous amount of opportunity in the world where some data are being collected, but we're not doing anything with it or data aren't being collected yet at all. And so there's this even greener pasture opportunity. So over the coming decades, over your career, Sid, uh, there's going to be so much change, so much more automation than ever before, so much opportunity for people like you to make a massive difference. And so, yeah, I think you picked a great career. And I'm, uh, to all of our listeners who are, you, you know, wherever you are in your data science career, I'm sh I hope that you're really excited about the impact that you're getting to make in the world too. All right, so starting to wrap up here, Sid, in every episode, I ask our guests if they have a book recommendation for us. Do you have one? I think, like always, anytime someone asks me about like a good book, uh, it typically comes from something that I've read recently. Recently, one of uh, the favorite books one of, wow, English, one of the uh, <laughs> best books that I have read recently um, was actually Thus Spoke Zarathustra um, by Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, mm. I'm reading some of his other writing, but it's older and not as well written. Whether or not you like his philosophy, um, it's he's just a great writer. So it's a really interesting like, book. You're into the new Nietzsche, not the old Nietzsche. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Only the freshest Nietzsche. Um, of course. So, you know, I don't really know much about that book. I also know that it's a, I guess it's like an opera or it's a famous piece of music, which I am familiar with. I um, can't remember who it's by, Strauss or something. But what's the book about? So uh, Nietzsche kind of had this, this misrepresented philosophy um, that he actually never got to really finish. Um, and his sister was... Um, let's just say like possibly on the wrong side of history during, during world war two. And she controlled a lot of his, his writings. So she, you know, kind of proposed this philosophy sense as like a, um, a leg up for kind of their view of the world. Um, but Nietzsche actually had this kind of philosophy of something called the Ubermensch or like basically the next evolution right. of man. And right. thus spoke Zarathustra is like, um, it's kind of a, a piece of prose, in which this character Zarathustra comes down from the mountain and decries God is dead, like this famous kind of sentence in literature now. Um, and then kind of through a series of like, kind of like poetic stories begins to kind of like shape this idea of like how humanity can kind of become better or kind of evolve um, in this kind of like post-religious world that, that Nietzsche saw himself in, in, in the late 1800s. Cool. That sounds fascinating. So it is prose. Uh, it's a it's a story that kind of conveys this philosophy. 
And yeah, sounds super interesting, as I'm sure a lot of his writing is. All right, so Sydney, this was a fascinating episode. We got to hear a lot about your early career, which I'm sure is inspiring to tons of listeners. Um, you know, options for getting started, uh, ways to stay motivated, ways to stay engaged with uh, the data science community. And um, so I'm sure lots of people will be interested in following you. I guess the best way is probably to find you on LinkedIn. Yeah, I am Sydney Archidiakono on LinkedIn. Um, I'm sure we can share a link or something so no one has to remember how Absolutely. to spell my last name. Perfect. It will be in the show notes. That'll be easier for me than trying to even read out the spelling of your last name. Um, <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thank you so much for being on the show, Sydney. And maybe we can have you on in the future and fill us in on how your career is evolving. I'm sure that the guests would be into it because you're an outstanding uh, and engaging explainer of concepts. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. What a cool and inspiring guest Sydney was. In this episode, we learned about why a full-time computer science degree may be the ideal starting point for a data science career, particularly if you don't have any prior programming experience. We talked about traits and strategies to be a wildly successful early career data scientist like Sydney is, including discipline, consistency, and methodically growing your network in the industry. And we talked about why graph theory is cooler than you might have thought and fascinating applications of graph convolutional networks for training models with graph data, including the spectral and PyTorch geometric Python libraries. As always, you can get all of the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, and the URL for Sydney's LinkedIn profile, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com 477. That's superdatascience.com 477. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd of course greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app or on the Super Data Science YouTube channel, where we have a friendly video version of this episode. To let me know your thoughts on the episode, please do feel welcome to add me on LinkedIn or Twitter and then tag me in a post to let me know your thoughts on this episode. Your feedback is invaluable for figuring out what topics we should cover next. Since this is a free podcast, if you're looking for a free way to help me out, I'd be very grateful if you left a rating of my book, Deep Learning Illustrated, on Amazon or on Goodreads. You could give some videos on my YouTube channel a thumbs up, or you could subscribe to my free content-rich newsletter on johncrone.com. To support the super data science company that kindly funds the management, editing, and production of this podcast without any annoying third-party ads, you could create a free login to their learning platform at superdatascience.com, or consider buying a usually pretty darn cheap Udemy course published by Super Data Science, such as my Mathematical Foundations of Machine Learning course. All right. Thanks to Ivana, Hyman, Mario, and JP on the Super Data Science team for managing and producing another amazing episode today. Keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science podcast with you very soon. <laughs>